talking about your first night after your uh, second coming <laughs> to Israel. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. It was really a second coming. Um, we walked along a dim corridor. I think I mentioned that before. A lady who, who put her hand around me and realized that I was becoming rather upset and she thought I was going to panic. I thought I was going to panic because I suddenly realized that I, would, I had let myself in for something without taking into account that this time coming back to Israel before I'd been in Palestine in Eretz Israel, this time I was really on my own and I felt so alone and I was dismissed by the group who had interviewed me and said, yeah, you can be a nurse because we're so short of nurses that we take people who've had no training at all and you can go as a practical nurse and we would be very pleased. And they sent me on my way. And this lady accompanied me and she was kind, spoke to me and said, don't worry, I'm sure you're going to feel very comfortable in the hospital. It's called Teletwinski and there are many English speakers there. But she said, you know Hebrew and that's going to be a great advantage for you. I'm very curious about you, she said, how do you know Hebrew? But we don't have time to talk about that. And um, I fell asleep in this little room with many other new recruits. The next morning early, I was put on a bus with many others. I don't know who they were or what their um, missions were, but I was taken to Telatvinsky, which today, I think I mentioned it before, is Tel Ashomer, one of the biggest hospitals in the Middle East and a great, a great place for the most uh, advanced medical treatment. So that is where we more or less stopped last time. And my adventure as a Machal nurse <laughs> started. The, the accommodation that I went, was given was in a room with three other nurses. And um, they took me and showed me where the showers were and showed me where the toilets were and, and then took me to the dining room. And then one of them said, come on, I have to take you to meet Leah, the head nurse, because you're going to be um, assigned to the intern wards for internal medicine. And um, I think this nurse who helped me was called Miriam. I don't think that was her English name, but we all called her Miriam. And it reminded me, it reminded me of Miriam Rivivim somehow. She seemed to be that sort of easy going person. And she said, come on Ruth, come on, we're going to see Leah. And I met Leah on the ward, ward number 35. Now, when I talk about that to my grandchildren, or even to you, Doron, you imagine a ward in a hospital, a modern ward. Whereas here, the wards were old barracks of, that belonged to, I think it was either the American or the British Army. And they were these long trifim, these long huts, which were in a shocking state, and the Israelis um, renovated them to a certain extent, brushed them up, put in beds, and made these into hospital wards. It was really very primitive, and I was really taken aback. I didn't realize to what extent we were short of everything. To me, it, it, it wasn't enough that these barracks were so simple, these simple huts with rows of beds inside, but we didn't have the simplest equipment. We used to 
um, boil these syringes for injections on a little um, play, hot plate and use them again and again and again. We'd, we'd squirt water through the, through the syringes in boiling water and that is how we used them for injections. We hadn't enough sheets we hadn't enough pillow slips, we hardly had enough blankets, let alone towels, let alone pyjamas. Everything was in short supply. We used to use band wash bandages and reuse them. There was nothing like disposing of everything. On the one hand, I can say that there was never any litter because we used everything and utilised everything. Even the paper from the white cheese was washed and used again to wrap things in. And nobody complained. It was amazing. I was immediately given my duties. And Leah helped me very much. She was a graduate of Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. To me, it sounded like the, being the Queen of England. <laughs> and there was another nurse on our ward, Hansi, who was also a Hadassah hospital uh, graduate and these two nurses were very strict and very good and very kind. Hansi was less kind than Leah and Leah was the head nurse. She took me under her wing and she gave me a lot of help because she knew that um, I had never been trained as a nurse although I had learned a lot in Red Cross and I'd read up a lot before I came but she never called me to order and each day I, I learned more and more and helped her and helped the other nurses until I was given my own particular duties. I knew the, the medicine cupboard by heart because I had been, I had studied biochemistry so I knew a lot about that and I'd studied dietetics so I knew a lot about nutrition and they wanted me to be in the nutrition department, but I wanted to stay in the wards. We had, in our wards, we had pe people, soldiers, who came from different lives, different lifestyles, different ways of life, different places. We had sabras, we ha who came and who had been in the Palmach and who had been in the Negev. And we had soldiers who had come straight off the ships, new, new, newcomers, similar to the people we had come across with uh, on the Kedma. And these people didn't know Hebrew. They, they, they landed in, in, in Israel. They were given a gun and said, go and fight. And they did. And I had three of them on my ward in one, one, at the beginning. And these three spoke to me uh, gibberish. I, I, think, I think what they were talking was Polish. Mm. Um, but as soon as they could, they were out of bed to help me. I remember one day I was trying to move something, a heavy piece of furniture. And, um, and I had to help a, 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 a wounded soldier at the same time. And before I knew what was happening, one of these uh, Polish soldiers came up to me and he said, Rut, I will help you. And he said, you stand. And he helped me do what he had to do. And I said, you go back to bed, my man. You're not well. And this was the attitude. People were helping each other. And during the night, new patients were being brought in right through the hospital. Soldiers who were wounded, soldiers who were in shock. Um, and there was activity 24 hours a day and night. One day, we were brought, uh, brought, they brought in a young kid of 17 or 18. He had run away from home to look for his father. His father was fighting in the Negev somewhere and this young boy decided to run away and look for his father. He, um, Morty, and he was delirious and had pneumonia and he didn't know 
that his father was in one of the um, surgical wards, very, very seriously wounded. And we had this Morty, and his mother didn't know where Morty was, and his mother didn't know where her husband was. And we managed to contact the mother and say we had found Morty, and she could come along and see him, but she was serving up in the north. Um, and Morty and I became great friends. He was, he was a sweet young man. Um, when I was on night duty and I came in one morning, Morty said, I thought you'd run away, I'm so <laughs> glad you're back. And in the end he was brought to see his father, who was, said he was a period, he was a, um, an amputee lost one of his legs. Um, he was in the paraplegic ward under the help of Mir um, Miriam uh, Rosenberg, Mildred Rosenberg, who was one of the best physiotherapists um, we had in the country. She was a graduate from New York and she had this special centre for, for um, very seriously um, surgical cases. And the stories are so numerous um, that it's hard to, to place one's day of daily life in, in how we functioned. I know that there were certain highlights. For example, one day we came onto the wards and there were piles of blankets and sheets and towels and there was equipment, there were bandages and there was cotton wool and there were syringes and on stamps with, with love from South Africa. I remember that at that time we came into the dining room for breakfast and there was jam from Cape Town. So we were all terribly proud and th this was how the Jews all over the world were helping and this is how the South African Machal didn't only send people over but they sent equipment and I know that they didn't send anything they were told by the authorities in Israel what was needed urgently and it was flown over and that is how, I don't know whether they said they needed jam urgently but they sent over tins of jam from from Cape Town but the, the equipment started to come in and gradually we had the possibility of changing sheets and giving the soldiers clean beds to sleep in and clean bandages that had not been rewashed and rewashed and rewashed and the food was always very simple, but there was always bread and jam, and the, the, depending on how seriously wounded the soldiers were, their food was, was um, rationed. And we all accepted our rationed food without, without thinking about it. We never thought that it could be different. Mm. Things started to get different gradually as the months went by. But at the beginning, we had the, um, the simplest and most difficult periods. Now you ask me another question. Yes. <laughs> what, maybe if you can uh, give one or two of the toughest moments you had in the hospital and maybe one or two of the happiest uh, okay. moments when you were there. I think one of the toughest was, to me Leia, the nurse, was an example and I looked up to her. She was for me a pillar of strength and I, I not only admired her for, for being so strong and so efficient but because we became friends and one day she came to me and she said, Ruth, I want you to come with me. And I remember that she told me her husband was serving up north on the Lebanese border, on the Syrian border. And I know that she was afraid he had been taken prisoner. And she said, Ruth, we have to go up north. They found our husbands, those who were prisoners of war, 
and I have to go and identify his body and I want you to come with me. And I looked at her and I thought to myself, I've always leaned on Leah and I've always thought that if I was in need, the first person I would go to would be Leah. And now she's asking me, Ruthie Soretsky, to go with her. Will I be strong enough to support her, to give her the help that I know she could give me? But I said, Leah, of course I'll come with you. And we were taken up in a truck. We sat in the front with a truck driver and there were some people sitting at the back of the truck. We travelled all the way up north. I think it was to, to the hospital in Svart or Poria, near Tiberias. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the smaller hospitals. And Leah said, would you come in with me? And I went in with her. And I saw what the Syrians did to dead bodies of our soldiers. And that was one of the most terrible sights I've ever seen in my life, and the most heartbreaking. And Leah held my hand, and I held her hand. And she identified him, and we left. And I think that was one of the most horrifying experiences, and it was also one of the most revealing experience, experience for me because I realised then what we were up against. I realised then that our mentality was different, that we had prisoners of war and they had prisoners of war, but they, they didn't behave in the way they should have behaved according to the Geneva Convention according to our rules. So that was one of the most difficult. Another very, very difficult period um, that I can remember was when we were, we were we, they brought in about six um, people, soldiers, who didn't look like soldiers, they, they actually looked much older, um, who had been prisoners of war in Jordan. And they were all drug addicts, because what had happened there was that they had made them into drug addicts so that they would reveal their secrets, about the, the security secrets. So they gave them drugs and um, and of course, the, the, these people became, they craved the drugs. And they had been returned physically, they were, they were all right. And they put these five or six, I think there were six of them, into our ward. And they said, you have to take care of them and you have to see that they're going to be dried out. That's the expression they used. They're going to, we're going to have to wean them off the drugs. Um, and we need your cooperation because they'll do anything to get the drugs and they'll even um, steal from the medicine cabinets. So we have to keep our eye on them. And they gave us one military policeman who was a kid, a youngster, who didn't give a damn about anything and he certainly didn't understand how serious the matter was. He saw these men who, who looked physically fit and they had um, some sort of routine during the day. Um, they were put into a special section of the ward. We gave them work to do and we wanted them to help us. But it was heartbreaking to see these men suffering because they needed the drugs. One of them went completely berserk. He, he completely screamed and, 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 and hit out at everybody and lay on the floor because he had reached a, a point of crisis. Um, they had to tie him down in order to let him overcome that period of time. Um, <clears throat> so that is another story. What happened with them at the end? 
with these? Um, <clears throat> actually, as far as I remember, and this is a long time ago, I remember that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you stop just for yeah. a moment? <laughs> Kim, the drug addicts. Kim, so some of them were immediately, uh, after uh, I think about a week, which was a long week with them, and were removed. One or two remained. They were easier. And th they spoke to me. Um, and, and one of them knew English because that's what the Jordanians took advantage of. He was a very nice man and he told me about their experiences there. Um, he told me how the Jordanians had been trained by the British as fighters and that they fight clean. He said that they were good fighters and what they did was legitimate in, in terms of, of the war. That they never, they never felt that the the methods that were used by the Jordanians were worse than than they would receive in in in, in Israel, um, and when they were brought back here, they parted from the Jordanian um, uh, captors um, on very good terms. He told me that King Hussein would one day make peace with us. Um, and uh, he, he, that was also a very comforting way to hear about the atrocities of war after mm -hmm. having the experience up north with Leah and her husband and the Syrians. I think it was Abdallah back then and not Hussein. Kim, Kim. Uh, Abdallah was, was a Nazi, but I think he was talking about the young Hussein. Because oh, he already of, heard Kim, about Kim. Kim. <laughs> I think so, because it couldn't have been uh, Abdallah. Because Abdallah hated the Jews, and he he was he was in league with uh, with Hitler, and we all know it's a different. Uh, <laughs> let's let's leave it. But that that everybody knows. But he, he that was that was the impression that I got from him, um, and one of the happiest or I can say personal happy happy days I had was one day we were sitting um, in the nurse's room having a, a break and the uh, there was a knock at the door and uh, in came a messenger and he said I want Ruth Soretsky so I said that's me he said you if you're Ruth Soretsky here and he gave me an envelope he said this is for you so I said thank you very much and off he went. And I opened the envelope and in it was written that um, I, Ruth Soretsky, has now been promoted to Segen, to first, first Lieutenant, no more, no less. And she's now, it, it takes the authority of a qualified nurse and would she please put this new insignia onto her uniform <laughs> and from now on wear it. And that was it. I can show it to you later on. And of course, everybody hugged me, and Leah said, now back to work, and I took this piece of paper and rather thoughtlessly put it in my pocket. And it's a bit crumpled. I've still got the original, <laughs> but I should at least have folded it up. I put it in my pocket and went back to, to my duties. So that was definitely a highlight of... <coughs> Sorry. I love Briot. <laughs> that was definitely a highlight of my um, experience there. There were bright moments. A lot of the South Africans were befriended by people in the country. I, I knew a lot of people, not, not a lot, but quite a few people who had known me in 46 who came to visit me. And, the pe uh, and we used to get lifts with the ambulance to Tel Aviv to spend an evening in Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, I had friends there, uh, the Epsteins, their daughter Marguerite worked with me um, in, in the hospital. And 
uh, the Epsteins used to say, Ruth, you can now go into the bathroom and enjoy a bath. But remember, we don't have a lot of water in Israel. Because the first time they let me go into the bathroom to have a bath, I think I used up their monthly ration of water. And they didn't like that at all. So after that, they warned me to take it easy. But people were very kind. And the English-speaking community of Machal people, were highly valued and recognized and admired because they were easy. The doctors and the nurses of Machal took over their duties and at the same time became part of the team. They never segregated themselves, although of course it was easy to sit and talk English together, but they always felt friendly towards all the communities. And I think that what hurts me today is the, the fact that not enough uh, is known today about Machal. It seems to be one of the best kept secrets in the country. And that is why I'm gratified that we are having a chance now to talk about what Machal did. Because just talking about our hospital in Tel Atvinsky, it was easy to say, and I think without exaggeration, that the contribution in that hospital of Machal was without doubt even crucial at times. And yet when Tel Shomer had its 60th anniversary recently, they hardly mentioned Machal at all. I was expected to go, but for some odd reason, I wounded my leg and I couldn't get there. But it's a pity that Machal does not get the recognition that it should get, not at schools, not at universities, um, because the, um, for posterity, for the future generations, I think it is important to show the war of liberation, the war of independence that we fought, would not have ended so well for us if it hadn't been for Machal. One can definitely stipulate that. Another question. <laughs> um, were there any patients that you formed a special connection with or um, that you have very strong memories of? Well, there was young Morty, who I didn't, I wanted to follow up with him. With my patients, uh, there, there of course was the one. <laughs> um, one day I came onto the ward uh, after being on night duty. Now when we went on night duty, um, we, we worked, um, we worked until two o'clock at lunch time, and then we went off, and, and then we went off on night duty until the day after. So we actually had a night and a whole day away, and that gave us an extra day and a half. And we would come back on morning duty after a day and a half. So I had been on night duty, which means night duty, day duty, and the following morning I came back to the ward. And by then I was already a lieutenant and I went into the nurse's room and I got the, the instructions from the nurse who was, I was taking over from her and I saw the lists of names and I saw that there was a new patient in the ward or a, a few new patients on the ward and um, I made out the various um, lists that had to be made out and I went to do the rounds before the doctors came. And I was walking along, at saying hello and seeing the different patients. And I saw one patient lying there, but I didn't see his face because he was reading a book. And that book I saw was in English. And it happened to be Pierre von Parsons' Forgotten Ally, which is an, an amazing book, The Forgotten Ally by Pierre von Parsons. I thought, this is interesting. I have to see who's reading Pierre von Parson on the ward, and I went up to that person, and behind the book I saw 
a very striking looking man with green eyes and moustache and I see, I said, how are you? And I felt a bit flustered because he gave me a huge smile and I uh, hadn't felt that flustered since Uri in the Negev was killed in Beraslouj. And I became very strict as a nurse and I said, welcome to our ward. And I took his temperature, which I didn't have to do, <laughs> and I walked away. Um, later on, I went around the wards with the doctors and we got instructions as to what had to be done for each patient. That is how they do it in the hospitals. And I had to write down the, um, the instructions for each patient. And when we came to this patient, um, the doctor said, hello, Teddy. And he said, hello, Bruno. He knew, his, he knew the head doctor because his brother was a doctor and they were friends. Um, and I realized that this, this, this uh, soldier, this patient, wasn't uh, the, uh, the regular type. I also knew he was an officer. Um, and that uh, later on that evening, I was in the nurse's room writing out a report. And the door opened and in walked this patient. So I said to him, you're not allowed in the nurse's room, you know. Would you please leave? So he said, oh, hello, and he sat down. <laughs> and then he took a cigarette. And I said, you're not only not allowed in the nurse's room, but you're not allowed to smoke. And he said, do you want a cigarette? So I said, no, would you please go out? And while I was asking him to go out, Dr. Bruno walked in. And I thought, now I'm going to get it. And Dr. Bruno, in a very ironical way, raised an eyebrow and he said, I see someone is breaking the law in this room. So I said, I've asked him to leave and he won't. And then Dr. Bruno said, Teddy, I think you'd better leave. You're, you're, not, you're not making the nurse Ruth comfortable. But I realized that they knew each other and he left. And the following day, he was um, given a clean bill. He hadn't had anything seriously wrong with him. He had been one of the fighters in the Negev. They called them the Desert Rats, I think. And they had opened the way to Elat. And in Elat, he had had some sort of exposure, and he, they thought he had pneumonia, but he just had a very bad flu, which he got rid of in three days and he was dismissed. Um, and um, the special relationship was that he kept coming back <laughs> and inviting me to Tel Aviv and inviting me to meet his family. And um, uh, after a short time, I realized that it was becoming very serious. Um, and the war had, was, was reaching its end for us. And I asked for a transfer, transfer, transfer to Haifa because Teddy was going back to the Technion after he got his demobilized, uh, demobilization papers. But that's another story. <laughs> so tell me, ask me some more questions. <laughs> um, maybe when did you feel and the real change in the war? Um, as I told you, I was, I was a machanik for just under a year. Mm. And after six months, it was six months of really tough going in every sense. Things, things had lightened after th four months. But after six months, you could feel that there was a smoother running of the hospital in the different wards. The, different, the nurses and the doctors would be talking about it. The Machal doctors had um, th their duties were organized together with the, the Israeli doctors. And the Macha nurses worked together with the Israeli nurses. And all the cooperation and coordination made them the, the whole function of the hospital 
much, much better. I think that it even came down to the ambulances were well equipped compared to what they'd been at the beginning. All the, all the, the basics had, had changed because the world machal extended to the help we got not only with physical aid, but with equipment and material aid that we got. So that was, that was towards 1939, the end of 1939, yeah. um, things began to, to look very different. So in 1949 you really felt there wasn't, but there was, any, was there any point, I mean, I, I realize that you came relatively late, you, it, it was already the second part of the war and it was not, but was there any part that you did feel that people were worried that maybe we're not going to win the war? Or? I don't think, even before we came, talking to people, and I spoke to the Israelis, I, I managed to get one, join one convoy to Jerusalem. And that's a bit of a story, um, and that'll answer your question as well. Um, we got one patient there um, who was supposedly paralyzed on one side. He looked like a, an extremely noble British uh, officer. He spoke impeccable English. And he was given a special room. There was only one special room. And we were told that to vacate it for this person. And he, he duff came to our ward. Um, and uh, he was definitely paralyzed on one, uh, on one side. He would put out cigarettes on his own hand so that he couldn't feel anything. And he had an amazing way of talking and sense of humor very ironical, and all the important people were coming to see him. Even Ben Gurion appeared one day. Um, and then I was told that there, the, the great doctor, Professor Miller, was coming, a South African psychiatrist, to see him. But he had to get to Jerusalem. Miller couldn't get to, um, to see him in Tel Ashomer, in Tel Atvinsky. And he had, they, we had to transport this wounded soldier, if he was a soldier, uh, to this day I don't know if he was. Nobody would, could really put their finger on what he was or who was he was. What was his name? I, I, didn't, I never knew. He must have been someone very important. I think he was in security, <laughs> some, some form of security. Um, but he had to be transported to Jerusalem. And I was asked to accompany him. Uh, so we were put on a convoy. And he was, he was a very uh, interesting ladies' man as well. He would flirt with all the nurses. And he would make fun of all the doctors. And he would roar with laughter when he thought that he was funny. But all in all, he worried a lot of people. Because um, it upset the whole balance of our... Of our um, Ward. We had serious patients there, and not all the patients were like Teddy, Ben and Mar Blumenfeld, who came in and went after a few days. Um, and uh, I was told to pack a little bag and to go to Jerusalem. And uh, we were going to Jerusalem. And we put it were put uh, in, into an ambulance, which, which was like a um, um, command car. And we went in the, the convoy. We got through. If we hadn't got through, I wouldn't have been here mm. to tell the story. And he was taken to uh, Hadassah Hospital, which was then on Rehov, um, um, King George, uh, 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 Shama. All right, uh, Karen Kayem, in, in, uh, further up at the end. Uh, um, um, which is today be just Bikur Cholim, opposite Bikur Cholim was Hadassah. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. The and older bus. Yeah. And um, from there we parted company. 
and I went to see my f friends, the, the Herlings, Chaya Herling, mm -hmm. who was very much too busy to spend time with me. She was busy with the Haganah, not the Haganah now, but she was busy as a, a radiologist. And uh, the, the thought that it could ever have been different was never there. Although Jerusalem was in siege and had been in siege. And th although things were improving, there was so little. W when we got our, eventually got our discharge and I decided to remain in Israel, um, we were put on rations. And um, when one talks about how much we got then uh, on our rations, people don't believe us. Even in Jerusalem, water was rationed. Yes. The short time that I spent there, I realized when we got back to Tel Aviv that Tel Aviv and Jerusalem were two different worlds. And yet the little time I spent in Jerusalem, I never heard anybody complaining. There was something very strong and positive about the people. If they did complain, it didn't come to my ears. Mm. And l later on when um, I transferred to the military hospital in Haifa because of Teddy, um, and then I, be I worked as a dietitian. I, mm. And they wanted me to carry on as a dietitian, um, but that, that's another story that I, I didn't. Um, I went to the Hebrew University later on and became an English teacher and a teacher of English literature. But I never lost touch with the profession of dietetics and uh, nutrition. So um, the war ends. Maybe you can describe the feeling that you have when you know the war is over and you have to decide what you're doing now or... Oh, now we're getting into something <laughs> very personal. It, um, turn it off for a moment. Yes, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, you wanted to ask me something. Well, you, me. I think you did want to talk a little bit about uh, Mildred. Right. Um, Mildred um, Rosenberg um, was a, uh, and I've mentioned her name a few times, she um, came from New York um, and she was a, a master of um, occupation of, of physiotherapy. I think, although she, she also did a lot of occupational therapy without being a master of occupational therapy, but she, she was a, 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 um, an authority on paraplegics. And up to that time, many of our paraplegics had been treated incorrectly because of ignorance. And the result was that they, some of them were, were, they were um, left um, uh, maimed because, the, because of the, the incorrect treatment until the, the Maha people who were physiotherapists and and and, um, and people who were um, uh, experts in in bone structure in all the um, the expertise of, of of medical science which our doctors didn't have because we were such a young country what were we I mean we had one pilot. <laughs> And how many doctors did we have? And many of the doctors who came here from Europe didn't have the the information and the grounding that uh, that our doctors had and our nurses. And Mildred came to Tel Shomer to Tel Litvinsky, and we immediately felt this was a presence. She was a tall lady with very dark black hair, and an authority. And when, when I met her, um, we were immediately friends. Now, Mildred went to no end to get what she wanted. She would not take no for an answer. And she went to Professor Spiro, who was then Dr. Spiro, who was head of Teletvinsky, and she said, I want a center for paraplegics. And this is what I want. And she gave him a list 
of what had to be there and what equipment was needed. And she got it. Mm. If they didn't have it in the country, it was brought in. And this centre was the foundation for the centre for paraplegics that they have today at Tel Hashomer. And to my distress, her name has never been put up on a plaque. Oh, really? And her name is, has never been remembered. Because as a Macha person, Mildred went back. Oh, she did go back. She went she back. Stay. She kept coming back to Israel. Mm -hmm. When I came to live in Jerusalem, Mildred was here. She had to look for me. And she found me um, after I lost my first, uh, my, my first husband, Teddy, whom I met when he was my patient. And, but Mildred did not get the, uh, the recognition that she should have received. And that, of course, is something that I hope this film will bring about, and perhaps um, something could be done to remember her by. That was um, one of the stories I wanted to tell. Um, something a bit amusing <clears throat> about learning Hebrew. Because I knew Hebrew to a st certain extent, um, and a lot of people didn't know Hebrew, and some knew more than I did, um, they had at Beit Rutenberg, Rutenberg's house in Haifa, in Haifa yeah. do you know? Oh, yes. um, they had a center for Macha people to have a week or ten days of learning Hebrew, or bettering their Hebrew. And um, I was told that I'm, I was chosen to go with one of the groups, and we got to Haifa, and we had a, a really good time, and we learned Hebrew, and because I was someone in between, I was in the intermediate group. There was beginner's group, the intermediate group, and the advanced group. So Ruth was in the intermediate group, and at the um, end of this 10-day session, we were in, supposed we had a very good um, party and um, evening, or to, first of all, to show how much we had learnt and all the important people were coming to see these machaniks and see how they had progressed in Hebrew and as well as having a good time and singing Israeli songs and dancing the horror. <laughs> And um, they told me that I was chosen to give the talk representing the intermediate group. Um, and they gave me a subject. They said, you must discuss the comparison between the Betei Knesset, the synagogues in Israel, with the Betei Knesset in South Africa, <laughs> and see that there are differences, the way people behave, and the way they, um, they, they have the, the, the different um, customs, etc. Um, so I prepared a speech and a talk, which I thought was pretty good, and my turn came, and I stood up, and I said, Today, Hayom, I need to from Africa, in my Bete Kise, the Eretz Israel. Meaning, uh, today I'm going to compare the lavatories in South Africa with the <laughs> lavatories in Israel. I confuse the word Beit Kisei with Beit Knesset. And a lot of the people had already been sitting there very tired and bored, and suddenly they all sat up and they, they, didn't, they didn't believe what they were hearing. And my talk, of course, took on a completely distorted <laughs> meaning. The connotations of the ladies came to the Beit Kisei to watch the men. And the men um, used to sit and talk there, and many of them didn't concentrate on what they were doing. And the children disturbed. And the people were sitting there, and they were rolling with laughter. And I couldn't understand why they were being so rude. And I felt very embarrassed because I had really worked at this. And in the end, I sat <coughs> down and there was a pilot from in America, George Honey, I think his name was. And no, Honey is what he said. 
well, anyway, a pilot from, from America next to me, and he said to me, oh, honey, he said, you've blown it. <laughs> <laughs> and I found the, the reason people had been laughing at me, because I had confused these two words, and I was so embarrassed, I got up and I ran to my room and I wouldn't come out of my room for two days. <laughs> and afterwards they told me that years later, they didn't remember me, but they remembered my famous speech. So that was one of the hilarious e examples of my experience as a machalnik. But the machal really were helped with the Hebrew at Beit Rutenberg. A lot of them came away learning, knowing something. So that is the story of, of the Machal. But there was, a po was there a point during your service when you felt that language was a barrier? That always, mm -hmm. always, because when you, when you speak your own language, the words flow. But when you've got to get onto a bus and you want to say something simple and you think you know Hebrew and you can't find that one particular word, then everybody gets behave, impatient behind you. Um, language it can be a barrier. And one of the reasons I became, I accepted the, the work as an English teacher was that I felt that I didn't know enough Hebrew to work with my own language, to become a dietitian and to, to further, to complete my BSc in in, in Israel, I didn't have enough Hebrew, and that was a barrier. Otherwise, I would have gone to the Hebrew University, and instead of doing English literature and doing a master's in English, I would have done my master's in, um, in science and, um, and dietetics. And to this day, I think that that, that barrier remains, because you have through the world today so much English that people who come to Israel today can manage without Hebrew. They lose out on knowing the culture, they don't have contact with the literature, with the drama, with the music, uh, the, um, the poetry, um, with the humour. That means they live separately because of language barriers and that is one of the reasons why I kept away from my South African and my English-speaking friends um, because I wanted to become like the Sabras and I gained the advantages. Today I'm bilingual and I enjoy Hebrew as much as I enjoy English. But nevertheless, um, when I get very angry, I can't get angry in Hebrew. <laughs> I have to get angry in English. It doesn't work that way. And um, when I read, I read Hebrew much more slowly than I read English. So language is a barrier. And in order to, to really use the language, you have to be in an, in an environment where you have no choice. You have to speak Hebrew. Because if you have a choice, they're going to speak to you in English and you're going to speak to them in English. But when I went to Rivivim, although some of them knew English, they gave me no choice, and I had to speak Hebrew. Um, and as a machanik, it helped me very much, because I integrated much more easily into the working of the ward than some of the Macha people, because they had to have everything translated, whereas I managed very well. And every day I was learning more and more Hebrew, terminology, I was beginning to read the Hebrew manuals on nursing, I was beginning to use the, the words that they use in Hebrew for nursing and not the English. So on the one hand, I was translating for the other English nurses, English speaking nurses, and on the other, the Hebrew speaking nurses were speaking to me in Hebrew. And um, th I, did th I think that in that case, in, in, the, in that um, instance, I am um, I think I did quite a good job as a translator without uh, being aware of it because it worked because the, the words came more easily to me when you when you begin to know a language it becomes um, re regenerative and and new words 
form themselves. You don't have to learn every word. So my language was already becoming quite fluent as a machanik. So before we move to the events of after the war, uh, just one more question. Uh, you talked about Revivim. Mm -hmm. During your time in Israel, during the war, did you make an attempt to reconnect with some of the people from Revivim? Maybe all his family or his friends? Or... I think I wrote about it. Um, at the beginning I was caught up in Macha. I was working in the hospital and I if there was absolutely no chance. And then I met Teddy. And I I kept away. I felt it wasn't fair to Teddy. And I was afraid. I was afraid to go to Revivim. I was afraid to speak about Revivim. I think that if I'm going to be fair in front of the camera, I think that somewhere along the line it must have hurt Teddy very much because he knew in the background there had been Uri who brought me to Israel. And to, to Uri I made the vow that I would come back and that I would spend my life to the best that I can to serve the people of Israel. But when I married Gidon Stern, after I lost Teddy in 73, and I remarried in 78. In 1980, I wrote my story of Revivim, and I brought it to the kibbutz to Revivim. And I, it was, it's written in Hebrew and in English. And I came there, and I re-established contact with Revivim. And Uri's brother, Ephraim, read my story. Uri's brother Ephraim is 15 years younger than Uri was. He was a Ben Skenim, Skunim as they say. Mm -hmm. And he came to find me. So I re-established contact after f almost 50 years with Revivim and with Uri through his brother Ephraim. Mm -hmm who doesn't live in the kibbutz. And Uri is not buried at the kibbutz, he's buried in Tel Aviv. He came from a, a Tel Aviv family. And um, there was a memorial weekend for Uri um, two years ago, three years ago, and I was there with my children. We spent the whole day in Revivim with Ephraim, with his family, and with all his friends at Biras Luch where he was killed mm -hmm. and at the kibbutz where there were there were days of the, the whole day was a day of remembering and the children were playing and the restructuring of the Chomava Migdal mm -hmm. the watchtower and the fence and how it was then so I've sort of closed the circle and now that Gidon Stern has gone, I have the memories of different periods in my life which connect me to this land of Israel. I came here as Machal, and in my heart of hearts, I'm still a Mitna David. Mm. I, I'm still a volunteer. And wherever I can, I still work and volunteer with the with whoever needs it. I work with Army Disabled. Um, uh, I've worked with Army Disabled people um, way before 1982, when my son Giladi was in Lebanon and he was missing, but thank God they found him. He was in the tank corps. And this is the way it is in Israel. We're all part of the whole mosaic, which is Israel and we all have our own stories to tell. But without the story of Machal, I think that Israel wouldn't have been able to overcome enormous difficulties, especially in the time of the War of Independence. There the contribution was so massive 
and was so spontaneous and was so heroic because the men who had been in the war, the Second World War for five years who came back to their homes and instead of starting anew heard about the predicament of Israel and they got up and came here to serve and I think that deserves a word in every household that Machel should be known about just as we have all our war heroes <laughs> they're the unsung her heroes of the war of independence and today of course there's young Machal, a lot of young people who come here and serve and when we have our war, war memorial service on Yom Zikaron, the young Machal appear uh, to, to celebrate and to remember together with the old Machal and that's the way it is and we have to change the tape. Pick a there. <laughs> okay, rolling. Yes, yeah, uh, she cares. Okay. So, so the war is over. You you came to take part in the war. Now, you have to decide if you are staying in the, or going back to South Africa. And why why did you decide to stay? Okay. That is a, a really um, a very significant question because. Um, it was expected that Macha go back. When they brought us over, we each actually had the right to 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 go back. Meaning, not the, not the, that's not the right word, but we had the means. That means they paid for us to go back. They um, they uh, expected us, I think, to go back. So you had a return ticket. We had a return ticket want. to go back in, Ken, which I actually used about three years later <laughs> when I had a little boy of two, a uh, giddy. But um, when I came over as Machal, I don't think I thought far ahead. I was that sort of person. When I came over in 1946, I had these wild ideas of a great adventure and then I had the experience of Rivi Vim and the Negev and learning from Dr. Zevil Nai about Israel, about Eretz Israel and I became imbued with the Zionism and with Chalutziut and with taking part in rebuilding the country after 2,000 years. So I, in 1946, I completely changed from being um, a rather um, flight, not flighty, but happy-go-lucky young woman looking for adventure. And I loved the idea of adventure, going to the Middle East, I mean, going to, to Eretz Israel. The whole idea seemed marvelous. I didn't have deep thoughts about that. When I came over as Machal, I came over with a mission. I had lost Uri and I came here knowing that I was going to contribute and I didn't think ahead as to whether I would stay or not. I think in my subconscious I knew I wouldn't go back. It, it, didn't, it didn't seem something that I could um, analyze at the time. I lived from day to day, it was war time and the, that's what war is all about. You, you live from day to day and everything is centered around the here and the now. The, the fighting, the wounded soldiers, the people who need help. So my whole lifestyle, my whole mission in, as Machal was helping now what I had to do and if I thought far ahead it was to whether I was going to go to Tel Aviv for Shabbat or not and have a bath at the at the, the Epsteins that was about as far as it could go I didn't think far ahead and although I was much more serious and very idealistic I was also a very happy young woman I loved to dance and I loved the songs of Israel 
and I loved the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra and I loved the the whole ambiance of, of, of the country. It, it imbued me with its spirit. You'd get into a, 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 a truck with a truck driver who's going to give you a lift and he's singing Mozart. You see, that was the magic of Israel. You came into families' homes in Jerusalem and they had a simple couch, but they had a good reproduction on the wall. And there was classical music on the little gramophone or on the radio. So the whole country to me was fascinating. There was, the simplicity was enriched with culture, with ideologies, with helping each other, with the spirit of what we were doing. But looking far ahead was something I don't think I was capable of. And then, of course, when I met Teddy, and he said, let's get married. And I thought that would be a good idea. When was that? That was very soon after we, he, he became my patient. Mm -hmm. um, I think we hardly knew each other for a month and a half. Oh. Um, and um, my family became frantic in South Africa. And you mustn't forget, it wasn't the days of telephones. The, People didn't have telephones in their houses. Uh, very few had, and there were there was no TV. So to get messages across you, they would send cables or wires, and the post office in Haifa became very anxious to meet this Ruth Suretsky because messages were coming across to the post office in Haifa to say come back to South Africa and bring Teddy to South Africa, but don't do anything silly and don't do anything rash, wait. But of course, we didn't want to wait. And my uncle who here was the first minister of interior um, became very angry with me because he said I should wait and I don't know Teddy well enough. And he wasn't prepared even to meet Teddy's family because he said it was completely irresponsible to start getting married when we hardly knew each other. So I Wait, went, so your uncle was here in his Yes, he was my mom's youngest brother and he had made Aliyah and his wife had died. Um, and he felt very protective towards me. What was his name? His name was Gary. Yaakov Geary. Oh, Yaakov Geary, okay. Ken. And um, he, my mum was also a Geary from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he really uh, let me down in my estimation, but um, I went and got married anyway. And when Teddy was asked why he didn't come to South Africa, my family had arranged for him to work there as an architect and he would have had um, no problem in settling there with, with me as his young wife. He said, you know, Ruth, what would you like to do? So I said, well, I came here to fight as Machal, but I want to hear first what you want to do. So I threw the question back at him. So he said, look, I was prepared to fight here and die for my country, so I want to live for my country. So I said, you know, I couldn't have put it better. So we're going to live for our country. And that was it. We never looked back. We were here and this is where we belonged. And those words have always remained in my mind. So we settled in Haifa when Teddy finished the Technion. And how did your family react when the marriage? Well, at a certain point, I think my family knew when I was younger, when I came in 46, that I was different. I wasn't the same as my three older sisters. And in 1948, they realized that I, again, even more so. And when I said I was going to stay, they, they, uh, they, they, they accepted it. Maybe in their heart of hearts they thought I would eventually come back. Yesterday I met one of my second cousins and she said that they used to talk about me. They came on Aliyah only 16 years ago. And she said that in South Africa I was always a conversation piece. 
people used to talk about me. And she said they spoke about me and said, when will Ruth eventually give up and come back to South Africa? But I didn't give up, never. And I also don't think that there's anything to give up. I think there's always something to add. So this is the way I brought up my children and they're here, thank God. And they feel the way I feel. And we love our country and we do what Kennedy said, what we can do for our country. And this is the way it should be. And I don't think we're alone. I think all the Machal people who stay here have made that choice. And they all are patriotic and they love the country. And they see, <coughs> they see that there's a lot to improve. We're not blind to the, to the fact that this unique country has brought in people from over 102 country, countries. People who came here in most cases because there was nowhere else to go. And we have made this country into a modern democracy with, with all the odds against us, with enemies who want to destroy us. We've brought people here who are not ideologists, who are not idealists, who are not here to give. We teach them when they come here. I remember when I was living in Ashkelon in Afridar and there was a big influx of Russian people who came and these were Russians who had felt the flame of Tsionot, of Zionism and they came here and they were told you can get this and you can get that and you can get that and I remember talking to a group of these Russians in English, some of them knew English and talking to their madrichim the people who were helping them to absorb into the, to be absorbed into the country. I said, why do you only teach them to take? You must teach them to give. We teach people to come here and to take. And because they don't have any Zionist background, they don't know that what it's all about. They don't know how it was in 46 or in 47 or in 48. They come here and they see supermarkets full of food and they see big cars and they think it was always like that, all these beautiful gardens and the kibbutzim that are luxuries for them. And they don't realize what it cost us. They, and some of them do, but on the whole, our education does not teach people to appreciate the great sacrifices we have made. I say whenever anybody comes to visit me from this, from another country, I take them first to Yad Vashem and then I take them to the military cemetery. That's when they can see where our young people have ha given their lives. And, um, and a lot of them have learned from that. So um, maybe a few words about these first years after the war in Haifa. What was the atmosphere like? You were senna, a young couple. Senna, 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 <laughs> senna. We had senna. Senna was austerity. And it was a, a very interesting. The first, the first hilarious exper experience I had with senna was my parents heard about this austerity and my mom was coming to visit and I had a new baby. So she was coming for the Brit and Gil and Giddy was born too early, so we had to wait for the Brit so my mother could be at the Brit. And my mother came over on the one of the first El Al airplanes, which was flown by Machal people. <laughs> and my mother, Frida, who was a mayoress of Boxburg, my mother and father were mayor and mayoress of our town, my mother came over and she was very pleased. She was thought that everybody would welcome her as the mayoress of Boxburg, but that didn't really worry her. And I'm just being funny. What she'd brought over was a lot of food. And she came onto this El Al plane with a huge turkey, a roast turkey, and hard boiled eggs and toilet paper, <laughs> and Nescafe and all sorts of things. And she brought it to Haifa. Um, and of course, we saw all this food and I was 
terribly embarrassed. So what we did, my husband was still finishing his Technion studies. I said, Teddy, we're going to have a party. And we invited all Teddy's friends from the Technion. I invited all my friends from my work. And we got rid of all that turkey <laughs> in, in one night. Um, and my mom thought that was very, very funny. She didn't realize that things here were, were different. She thought it was funny. She said, then what are you going to eat? There was fish filet. Now fish filet was something we all ate and fish filet could be made into chopped liver and fish filet could be made into different kinds of salads and it could be made, fish filet was one of the most, um, you can say, um, I can't think of the word at the moment, I'm thinking in Hebrew, um, but could be made into so many different dishes. Mm -hmm. we, we got, I think when I was pregnant, I got three eggs a week. When I wasn't pregnant, we each got one egg a week, and we got 100 grams of meat a week per person. Um, and we got a few pieces of yellow cheese. If you were pregnant, you got a few extra pieces of yellow cheese. And this is how it went. <coughs> but nobody was hungry. And nobody over ate. People weren't so fat as they are today. And I think we we had vegetables. We we had a bit of fruit. Fruit could be sent over from Cyprus. Apples could be sent over from Cyprus. So my parents sent sent me apples from Cyprus. But then I said I don't want that because here we have oranges. And gradually. This, this austerity proved that people could eat a decent diet without overeating. There were things like the black market, but I really think the majority of the people didn't touch food on the black market because it wasn't necessary. In Haifa, it was in the yeah, in the, uh, in the near the port. Was it? I think so, yeah. I didn't know. We lived on the Carmel. Oh, okay. But yeah. um, I, I really didn't know. I didn't know that, that, that people... We heard about it. But I, I, all our friends didn't need it. Because um, we, what we did eat was a lot of margarine. And years <laughs> later, on bread and, and, and jam, um, and, and uh, we ate vegetables there were vegetables that were available but it, it was it was fine and a lot of people um, would um, complain about not having enough meat but if we if we complained it was by telling jokes about ourselves um, children got enough there was enough milk for children and um, the the rationing gradually filtered, filtered out. It gradually became less and less. And when we moved to Haifa, we were already, then we, we took a place in um, near, in Beit Avicha, near Haifa. Teddy's family were living in Haifa. They had been there since 1932 from Romania. And Dr. Ben Amar Blumenfeld had this Italian villa uh, on the hills, on the on the cliffs of Netanya, and the cliffs were bare. There was the Blumenfeld house, Benemar house, which was this Italian villa because his wife Fernanda was an Italian baroness, who had married him when he was studying in Italy, and then they married again in Romania, and then they came here in 1932. And then about a half a kilometer away, there was the Magnus house. And on the other side, there was the Dunkner house. Those were the three <laughs> houses on the cliffs of Netanya. Um, and uh, they, they were lovely people and they welcomed me into the family. Uh, 
and I, I loved them very much and I still do. They're still my family here in Israel. And um, Teddy and I, when we moved to Netanya, because Teddy would be working with his brother, Dr. Ben Amar Blumenfeld, who was an architect, um, and Teddy finished his architecture. We took this place in Ayanot, which, not Ayanot, Bear, um, which um, was um, uh, uh, almost agricultural. So we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. So, um, one can carry on and tell about the different experiences. Why did I start teaching English? Because um, there were no English teachers. They used to say that if a person was born and had a birth certificate, that was good enough. So I was asked to teach English. And that's in Haifa still? In Haifa, no. In Haifa, I was asked to work as a dietitian. And they came to me from Kol Yisrael. They wanted me to give programs on the radio mm -hmm. and from the hospital, uh, to work at the hospital. And I was so caught up in being, I became pregnant three months after Teddy and I were married. I was so caught up in, in this new experience that I said I couldn't do it. But perhaps it was a mistake I made. I look back, um, but there. So I just worked there as a part-time dietitian, um, and I taught young girls at the Vito School Dietetics. But um, when we came to Netanya, I started to work as a, an English teacher, and then I started to take courses at the Hebrew University while I was having a family at the same time. And in the end, I became one of the senior English teachers and I finished my BA and I finished my Masters in English Literature. And then when Teddy died in 73, um, I came to, to Jerusalem in 75 and I became the head English teacher of the University High School. And my life in Jerusalem started a new era a new phase, which I love. I love Jerusalem very much. I've always loved Jerusalem. And I think it's a privilege not only to be in Israel, but to be living in Jerusalem. Uh, just another question. Uh, when, when you had a tragedy in your life and uh, Teddy passed away, um, did you have any thoughts about maybe going back to South Africa or it was too, you were too yeah, invested already? In never. This? Never, never. I visited South Africa. I visited South Africa many times. Um, and I love South Africa. I think it's a wonderful country. I always feel comfortable in South Africa. Um, but I, I think I feel comfortable in South Africa because I'm comfortable because I'm an Israeli. Um, and I found that although South Africa politics today, uh, the politicians, the government, is not pro-Israel, I've always found that whenever I've been to South Africa, I have found the um, support for Israel from wherever I've been. And for the black people are mostly Christians, and they are very pro-Israel. And the black people who've worked with my family for many, 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 many years, who know I'm in the Holy Land, know I always bring them souvenirs from, from Israel to South Africa. And one of them, Bertha, is a Lutheran, belongs to the Lutheran Church. Um, and um, they, they're sincere Christians. They, they, they feel very, very supportive towards Israel. Um, but for me, it was never even an option. Once I decided to live here, I stayed here with all my heart. And I feel that if I can change something for the better, help someone, then I, it's been worthwhile. And one has to have a bit of humor, one has to have patience, because people have come here, you know, from different ways of life. And I think if you go from house to house, you never find there is a family that hasn't had a tragedy. And if there is, then it's 
very unusual. So you have, <coughs> you have to, you have to live with the people. Not long ago, I went into the mush beer, the big department store. And I bought something and I went to the cash desk to pay and I was the only one there and the three cashiers were sitting and talking and I was standing there and waiting for them to serve me and they went on talking and I waited and then suddenly they saw I was there and they said oh we're so sorry so I said you know it's very interesting there's no country in the world where if you buy a gift for your daughter-in-law and you want to pay for it, you also learn about new recipes for Pesa. <laughs> so, so they looked at me and they said, we're so sorry, but to Daraba. And I think they learned something and it was all in good humor. So one has to know how to identify with people. Um, so maybe two general questions towards the end. Um, one is, if there is something that you could have changed in Israel, what would it be? Something that I could have changed in Israel. You don't ask easy questions, well, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the perspective that you have of really uh, you know, knowing this country for so many Look, years. One can't wave a magic wand. One thing that I would have liked, a dream about, they say if there are three Israelis or three Jewish people, there are three different opinions. I think one of the greatest gifts is that we think differently as different people. But sometimes our different ways of seeing the future, our different political views lead to, to animosity and hatred and anger instead of listening to each other. The one thing I would love to change in Israel is to let people listen to each other. Each one wants to give his own opinion but he doesn't want to hear what the other one says. That's a generalization. It's not always the case. We also generalize. We generalize too much. But one of the problems we have here, to a great extent, is that we, we should listen to each other and we should understand each other and not have this rift because we think differently. We should move a little, each one, in order to make way, because our strength is unity. There, this is what Churchill said, and not only Churchill, but united we stand, divided we fall. That, that is one thing I would change. And another, <coughs> what else would I change? I would change, perhaps, the rush for materialism. <laughs> I think that we, we've lost a lot of our modesty. I think we exaggerate with wanting more and more. Money has become too important. One of the, the uh, attractions for me that I felt and still feel today is the simplicity that I found in the people and in the way of life here. And that simplicity gave us far more wealth and richness and culture than all this rush for more materialism. That is one thing I think I would definitely change. Let us all be more modest. We don't need these huge cars. We don't need these huge houses. We can do with less. And we, can, we don't have to have these weddings where there is so much food that I feel ashamed. We can do with less, and people can eat less, and divide more. And that, I think, would bring us into our rich um, wealth of culture and ideals of what we want from Eretz Israel. We don't want to compete with the rich Jewish people in other countries. Let them have their wealth. They do good with it or they don't do good with it. But let us keep our modesty. Um, as someone who's been an educator for, uh, for so many years, uh, maybe two things connected to it. 
What do you see as maybe the major changes through the years of, of working with young people? And the second is, if there was something you could tell young people in Israel today, what would it be as someone who's, you know, who came as a, as a young person out of ideology? And, uh... Well, let's start with the second one. Telling young people, only if they ask. <laughs> because young people, well, first of all, and I'll give you the, I'll, I'll combine the two because when you say young people, that's a very relative term. There are young people of certain age groups. I'm talking about young people of 17, 18, mm -hmm. which are, who are the ones that I had most contact with. Um, and when they asked, we spoke about it. If they didn't ask, then they weren't interested. So, I, uh, I I had a lot of them who finished schooling and who today come to me. I have that picture on the wall there, that woodcut, the coloured woodcut, is Itai Altshula. He was, I was his mechanechet at the Tichon Liada. He's my friend today. And Michal, who is one of the psychologists um, of the southern area, um, was here just before Pesach. And so they come and they ask me questions and I speak to them and they share my joys and sorrows. When they were teenagers, I gave them a listening ear because when I received a new class of youngsters, I um, did what all the teachers do. You're, you're obliged before the school year starts to meet your new class individually. You meet each one and you have a 10 minute chat with them and you've spoken to them. And then in nine cases out of 10, during the course of the year, if you want to, um, if, you call, if you call one of your pupils for discussion, it means something's wrong. Something's been done that shouldn't have been done and should be called to order. Whereas my policy was that in the first three months of receiving a new class, I met each pupil for an afternoon talk. And in nine cases out of ten at the beginning they say, why? Have I done something <laughs> wrong? Is there something wrong? And I would say, no, let's just have a talk. And they would say, well, I suppose let's humor her because if that's what she wants, and we've got no choice. But this is what I do and this is what I did. And that became part of the, the system because once a youngster sits and talks to you on a one-to-one, -one, you have a cup of tea and you just chat, um, at first, it's very strained, but if you get through, you you eventually, you don't have to try, you just have to listen. And it's very hard for them at the beginning to, to just talk to their new machanechet, to their new educator, to their teacher. They can't understand what in the name of fortune she wants from them. My <laughs> but But um, after that, it, it becomes a different relationship because you know each one individually and it isn't only once a year. You find that someone will phone you at 11 o'clock at night, which is an extreme case, and say, I'm leaving home, I can't stand it anymore, I'm coming here, to this apartment here. And I would say, no, you're not, you go back home. But he says, I'm not, I've just had a fight with my parents and I won't go back. And I say, oh yes, you will, and I'm getting out to, to take you. And this is a 17-year-old in Yud Aleph, Tichon Liada. And he would say, no, no, don't, he'd say, no, don't come. Then I'd say, then go back home and give me a call when you're home. Um, but the fact is that he found an outlet and he spoke. And this is one of the reasons, I think, that as a teacher, as a mechanechet, um, it wasn't only the subject matter. It certainly wasn't the grades that they got. It was getting to know each one and each individual. There wasn't a class of faceless youngsters. There was a class of 
35 or 40 individuals and each one with his or her needs. And that is why I was very fortunate that I never took more than three classes because otherwise it's impossible for the teachers to cope. Mm. In our classrooms we have 40 youngsters and teachers take on, because they need the money, they take on four or five classes and they break. They don't have time to talk to their pupils. So that is one of the changes our educational system, system needs. I could go on about this subject for the next 20 years. <laughs> um, so maybe, do you have um, anything that you want to say? That you think that you, you, know, you didn't have an opportunity to say uh, before we uh, say goodbye? For now? Well, I'm sure there's so much. I'd probably think about tonight for about, a, about at, least, at least a dozen subjects that we could have spoken about. We can talk about education for at least another two hours, but I think that that isn't quite relevant to Maha today. I do say that the, my pride in our young generation is their carrying on the system of going to the army although there are those who don't go to the army. There are those who can't make it. But on the whole, we still have pride in our youth. And I think they are the most extraordinary youngsters in the world. Although they get drapesing all over the world and some of them don't do very well outside, I'm afraid. Um, but on the whole, they do. You only hear about those who don't. But I always say, when I go overseas, and I used to travel quite a lot with my husband, Gideon Stern, we used to say that they, t they speak about the Israeli tourists not being well-mannered. And if 400,000 went across for the summer, and Let's say 10,000 didn't behave nicely. What about the 30,000 you didn't hear about? Mm -hmm. You see, but we generalize in a negative way about ourselves. We have to try and help the 10,000 who didn't behave well. When I speak to youngsters before they go overseas, some of them come and say goodbye to me. Not now because I'm retired, but before they went away, they would come. And we'd talk about that. And some of them would say, we're going to sow our wild oats and I would meet them in Scotland. They no sooner finished with me here at school, and the following month I walked into a shop in Scotland, um, in Edinburgh, and there they were, and they said, Ruth, what are you doing here? I said, what are you doing here? But they were talking quietly, and no one would have known, you see. But we have to realize that we have a lot of people in our country who've never had the chance to be educated and never had a chance to learn the difference between the way others expect us to behave and the way we behave. But all in all, I'm very, I'm very proud of my people and I love them and I hope that they love me. <laughs> Thank you Ruth, it was a, <laughs> an honor and a pleasure. <laughs>
Um, here we stopped it in Tebi air, airfield, just as we stopped at other airfields in, in Africa to refuel. This is um, uh, our little plane, the Dakota, that we flew across on. Is that all right? Yeah, just now. Yeah, with a white shoes. Can you do it? Good one. I've also got that one in its original. Oh, you do, but uh, so we'll say it's something it's about it. Havanti, Havanti, Havanti. This is the um, a picture of me and one of the um, Haganah ladies who came to pick us up um, in Rome. Um, and we're on the Kedma going across to Haifa. And uh, she taught me how to play the Khalil, and I taught her how to say it in English. Okay. Here is, uh, I'm standing outside ward, the internal, internal medicine ward number 35 at the military hospital, Teletwinski, which is now Tel Um and that's Ruth Saretsky, the nurse. That's me. <laughs> right. My, and that, there, there you can see this much better. Show it to Natasha. Oh, okay. Natasha Hina. Yeah, Kepi. Can you please tell the story of the dance? Oh yes, we were on the to on the top deck. We stayed on the top deck of the Kedma, and all the uh, DPs, the new immigrants, were on the lower decks. And sometimes these what nineteen watchdogs who used to take care of me became very jolly. And here, one of them, I don't even remember who it was took me and said, come on, let's dance. And they got the picture for posterity. Okay. Came like a sister mother figure to me. Um, she's from the Hurling family and who originated out of the old city of Jerusalem. And um, until Pachayala passed away 20 years ago, she was my beloved friend who helped me through so many difficult periods in my life and who was part of my, my, my whole life. She, even my family regarded her as, as um, part of our family and her family um, regard me as part of their family. Do you have maybe a bigger picture of her? Uh, no, that's, that's just it. Okay, we can now we can say about uh, that's about Teddy. Okay. This is a picture of Ruth and Teddy in Tel Aviv. Teddy had been dismissed from the hospital and he invited me one afternoon to have coffee in Tel Aviv with him, 1948. Yes. Um, this is the original document I received uh, when I was promoted to lieutenant by the Israeli army in the medical corps and I took the piece of paper and put it into my pocket and I didn't realize that I was crumbling it but it still survived after all these years. Yeah. Mm.
cuts off. I mean, he, he's an idiot. What can you do? Yeah. Okay. But uh, but I think that they all the all the big leaders of Macha are here. So maybe, with, uh, so maybe we'll end this too. Yeah. Something from something more recent to that. Nahon, yeah. just a few years ago. Well, you're going to get it back, don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> no, this one I'm talking about. Oh, okay. See, when I came here in the 46. Ah, yeah. ah, 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 I see. Okay, picture, please. Can't see the back. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first, I just tell us about uh, the. This is, um, we were invited to the president's home um, to have a ceremony uh, in honor of Machal. And um, the uh, representatives of Machal are all there. Uh, and I was also invited, although I'm not a representative of Machal, but I'm a Machalnik. There, there's one other lady there, Tsipi, who's very active. You have, you've seen Tsipi. Did you take pictures of Tsipi? Mm, not too. This um, is the, the place where um, I came with um, that uh, paralyzed officer. Oh. So the, in this book, Testament, I appear, and this is the picture they took of me, he took of me um, outside, outside the hospital where um, I uh, then, the um, came. Um, this is an honorary, uh, I don't know what to say about this. Tell me what to say, do Actually, you don't need to say anything, yeah, because I'm reading it's it. It's pretty clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you don't need to say right. anything. Okay, so I, I think uh, if, unless there is something specific that you want us to add, maybe we can no, I think end this with is, this. this yeah. is enough. Yeah, it's sufficient. Yeah. Uh, last time I had things in order, and then I just put everything back. And now I'm going to have a big job getting to the back in Sorry. No, but um, it doesn't matter. You eventually came to see them. I'm sure a lot of the pictures that I wanted you to see um, are missing in, in what you saw. Well, you're very photogenic. But, um, photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, strange. Uh, it, I didn't. I didn't feel that I feel I was flowing uh, as I, I usually do. So I hope I was. Uh, so Ruth, can you please tell us about oh. the, pic the picture? Okay. My grandson Ran uh, finished his uh, basic training uh, in the um, army, and this was in the, his army base. And I, as his proud grandmother, was present, and I have that picture to remind me of the fact that Rani is pre representing Israel in the army, and now he's on a, an officer's course. And may he just be well, please, God, like, like all our soldiers, <laughs> God willing. <laughs>